Okay, are we ready? So can you, you hear me at home? Somebody at home, say say yes to Rob if you can hear me. If you can't hear me, then say no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good, all right. Thank you for coming, people from home, and especially people from here. People from home, you should be sad because people here got chocolate. So next time we do this in person, you'll know. Um, so I'm really, really delighted to introduce to you Professor Jackie Baltus, who I have known for a very long time. And I was just saying that when I introduce people for giving talks, I like to tell a story um, about the person and some shared experience. Jackie and I met in Osaka in Japan in a, at a meeting in October 2000. I think we, right. we figured out. Um, and it's one of the strangest meetings <laughs> I've ever been to. Um, but we've done a lot of things together, primarily through RoboCup um, over many years. And at one point we decided there should be a league, especially for undergraduates. So we piloted this league called, which we called the U League. Um, and we had a lot of fun with that. We had a, a sort of demo competition in Italy in 2003, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Um, and I didn't find out till afterwards that like none of our students got hotels that they just slept in the venue. Um, I don't know if you knew that at the time, but it yeah. explained why it sort of had a smell. Um, so uh, anyways, I'm going to just hand you over to Jackie, um, who is based right now in the um, National Taiwan Normal University. When I met him, he was in New Zealand and then spent a lot of time in Canada, um, has been in Taiwan. He'll tell you how long. And um, But he's uh, just starting a sabbatical year, so he's based in Germany for the uh, coming year. Um, and so we hope to start some collaborations while he's in a closer time zone and um, we'll see how things can kick off. So Jack, thank, thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Betsy. Uh, very glad to be here. So if our presentations work, then um, this one doesn't you need to press there. I need to press there and look there. Okay, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. So, I'm uh, at the National Taiwan Normal University. When they hired me, I thought it should be a lot more fun to be at the abnormal university, but <laughs> this is the uh, similar to the UK system. And uh, it means that originally when the NTNU was a teaching college, but now it's a full service university with engineering degrees and, and uh, everything you would expect from a university. If you're following along from home, then uh, you can actually go to this uh, web page, uh, which is the online version of this presentation. So this is actually what I'm presenting here. Um, I want to go through the projects that we're currently working on um, to give you an idea of uh, what I'm doing, the kind of research that I'm interested in. Since 2002, I've been working with humanoid robots. So for humanoid robots, I focus on the kind of research problems that are unique to humanoid robots. Um, we, Betsy talked about the RoboCup competition uh, where robots play soccer. Uh, that is a good robot competition, but it's not really unique to humanoid robots because at the moment, the competition that we have most of the robots need to figure out where they are on the playing field and where the opponents are. And so this is sort of a slam problem. Uh, you can do that with the wheeled robot just the same. So I was interested in research problems that are unique to humanoid robots, in particular, walking on two legs. That's uh, very different from driving around. Uh, in 2002, it was very difficult to get a robot to just walk on a flat surface, uh, carpeted surface. Uh, nowadays, we have very good algorithms, uh, develop technologies to be able to solve that problem. Now we're trying to push the envelope. So we're moving to uneven surfaces, uh, walking over uh, stairs, uh, down a pass in the forest. My wife and me, we like to go hiking. I always think, oh, how many years will it take before one of our humanoid robots can actually climb up to one of the uh, mountains? And then also push recovery. Uh, if our robots bump into something or bump into each other, then we don't want them to fall over. We want them to be able to recover. The problem that I'm mostly dealing with uh, that I find particularly interesting is complex motion planning. <laughs> so this is things like 
in my office, uh, in my old office at NTNU, uh, I had a door with two spring latches. Uh, it was like a deadbolt and a knob you had to turn. Um, so I had to turn the knob and I had to turn the key and then I could enter my office, which is not a problem if I have false hands free. But if I actually uh, carry a laptop, then that's not convenient because there was no way to place down the laptop. So what I came up with, <laughs> what I do is I turn the knob, I use my knee to brace it, to lock it, and then I use my, the key to open so I can go in and I still carry my laptop. Now, the, the thing is that I can ask my students to implement opening a door behavior for our humanoid robots, but none of them are gonna come up with this scenario, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if we if I want them to play soccer, no problem. They will they will implement walk forward, walk backwards, shuffle to the left, shuffle to the right, turns, uh, kick with the right foot, kick with the left foot. We parameterize these motions, and then that's it. That's all we really need. But the ability of humans to generate completely novel motions from scratch is is one thing that fascinates me, and I'm particularly interested in. And then also the general area of human robot interaction. Um, how do people relate to the robots? Now, I wasn't sure exactly about the background of the students uh, for this particular talk. So if you are experienced with robotics, then you may have been in the same situation. If I tell people that I'm talking about how to pick up things, how to open doors, walking on two legs, um, then they all say, well, I thought you're doing AI. And I'm like, that is AI, <laughs> right? Uh, I feel that this is at the heart of human intelligence, how to manipulate the physical world is crucially important. Now, AI research at the beginning and for many years has focused on higher level symbolic reasoning. Uh, started out with uh, 1996, Deep Blue beat the uh, world champion playing chess, Kasparov. Uh, 2016, uh, Lee Seduk, the Go champion, was beaten by uh, AlphaGo. So now we have computers that are actually, in that sense, extremely smart. They can beat the human world champion in playing chess, playing Go. <coughs> And not just that, any one of uh, graduate students are able to implement chess playing programs that will probably beat 80% of the people in the world playing chess. Not They won't beat the world champion, but they'll be able to beat a lot of people. Not because they're very smart, but most people are really bad at playing chess. Mm -hmm. This kind of bookkeeping, and if this happens and that, and keeping in your head all the possible world outcomes, is something that human intelligence is not very good, not very well suited to, right? But we don't really have a vision system that comes anywhere near the performance of a three-year-old kid in recognizing faces, the mother, the father, so on and so forth. So that's hard to talk about because it's uh, subconscious. And um, I wanted to just do a little demonstration of this. Uh, if I can get the two of you to come up here quickly. <laughs> you had the chocolate, so you have no reason <laughs> to, uh, to refuse. And you please lie down. <laughs> yeah. So now make him stand up. Yeah. Okay, no, 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 you're too fast. <laughs> um, Usually, if you want them to stand up, I would just say stand up, right? No, no. <laughs> but if I talk to my robot, then it would be like Shang Chi Lai, which is Chinese for stand up. My robot also doesn't understand Chinese, right? So then I need to tell them exactly each joint how to move. So now please do that. Make him stand up by moving all his arms, legs. <laughs> but try not to hurt him. Yeah. 
Okay, you you're, oh. you cannot help him. Right? You're telling him yeah. move your arm like this, push off the air, okay. don't pull him up. Yeah. But anyway, that that gets the point across. You'll see <laughs> every your shoulder joint, everything has to be controlled, right? And you need to tell the robot exactly how to do that, and you need to tell it the timing, and that's what makes it really really hard. Right? So thank you. Well done. <laughs> Well, so <laughs> for now it's always important reward, reward, reward right? Yes, yeah. and then we do a lot of reward. reinforcement learning in our lab too. Yeah. But, uh, we don't actually have well, another demonstration of the case. So as far as I said, vision systems are very bad. We we have a lot of problems with it. Uh, then people often say, but ImageNet, ImageNet now. The claim is it performs better than hum a human vision system, right? So if you're not familiar with ImageNet, it's uh, 1.7 Im million images that are uh, different things that they show, cat, uh, dogs, different breeds of dogs, Doberman, German Shepherd, so on and so forth. And then they ask people what is in the picture and people label it, right? And then they can compare it to a computer, what the computer sees in that particular picture. And the claim is that now we have a better vision system on the computer that it outperforms humans. But when you actually look at this in detail, then you realize that this kind of subconscious region is still far beyond what we can do. These systems are extremely brittle. Uh, the error rate is higher for humans than for the computer. The one, first reason for it is that uh, humans get tired, get bored, labeling cat, cat, dog, dog, cat, dog, right? So they make mistakes. But more importantly, uh, they have these categories. So there's Doberman and German Shepherds. And sometimes from a particular view, a person will mislabel a Doberman as a German Shepherd. That's counted as minus one. If the computer mislabels a chair for a locomotive, that's also mislabeled as minus one. But that's clearly not fair, right? Because no human would ever mistake a chair for a locomotive. But it's uh, different breeds of dogs or cats. Yes, sometimes we make a mistake. So here's some example of how uh, brittle these systems actually are. Uh, what's the picture on the left-hand side here? The computer tells us it's a panda, right? Great, that's correct. What's the picture on the right hand side? Should be a panda, but it's not. It's a gibbon. And the only difference is this tiny little bit of noise that is added to it. Now, if you tell me, independently of what it is, right? If you tell me this is something different from this, then I would claim that your vision is not very good, right? <laughs> And so this is a, an actual uh, generative adversarial network attack on this particular vision process. So it's particular to the current algorithm that is running. But still, I would say this is not a uh, robust vision system. If you can flip from Gibbon to uh, from Panda to Gibbon or vice versa, and here's the accuracy, 57%, here it's 99% sure this is a Gibbon. And we can make that even closer to 100%. Or more interesting for the people that follow Elon Musk, who says, oh, all we need is uh, vision on our self-driving cars. Uh, what is this? It's a stop sign, right? <coughs> If you don't have these black and white patches in there, the computer will recognize it as a stop sign. The vision system will recognize it as a stop sign. If you put in those patches, now it's read as 45 miles per hour speed limit. Right? So very different from a stop sign. So I would I think that the claim that we have better vision systems than humans is. It's true in, if you if you look at one particular way in which you evaluate this with a particular metric. But no sane person would say, if you mistake this for 45 miles per hour, go ahead, uh, would say that you have a very good vision system for 
uh, traffic situation. In fact, I hope not to have to share the road with you and, <laughs> and your algorithm. Um, <clears throat> now, our Blue Sky project is robots that are really useful for people, uh, uh, robot firemen, forest workers, uh, jobs that are dangerous or tedious. Um, but those are far into the future. So uh, we're looking at uh, robot competitions as benchmark problems. And I've been involved with the FIRA competition since uh, 2002, I became the president. Betsy and me have done a lot of work at RoboCup. And uh, I'm also, we'll talk about the uh, Humanoid Application Challenge, Robot Magic and Music, which uh, we're running since, Robot Magic we're doing since 2017. And before we had uh, uh, general entertainment music, uh, that sort of thing. Now, <clears throat> just a, uh, sort of talking about the importance of benchmarks. Uh, since we don't have real world applications yet, benchmarking, I think is really important. We want to make sure that our research is moving in the right direction, that we're actually making progress, but it's quite difficult, right? Because how would you even define what the best robot is? What's the best humanoid robot? What's the best vision algorithm? It really depends on what the application is. Sort of like asking what's the best car. Uh, depends on if you need to carry a big load or if you want to drive fast down the autobahn. Um, and even much simpler systems, like a full uh, robot system is extremely complicated, it includes actuators, sensors, mechanics, control, <coughs> processing, uh, communications. Um, one of the problems is that lots of benchmarks are set too simple, so they can easily be gamed. A lot of the robot competitions, you can build special purpose solutions for uh, this particular competition. And this is true also for CPUs. If you uh, are old enough to remember uh, the initial times when people were trying to just evaluate whether a 386 Intel CPU is faster, the same speed or slower than a, a power PC, which were the two CPUs used in uh, uh, Windows laptops and uh, Apple laptops at the time. Then that seems to be a much simpler question. Right? But even that turned out to be quite wrong with errors. So uh, at the beginning, we used MIPS, millions of instructions per second. Turned out that this was a really stupid measure to evaluate the performance of processors because once risk processors became common, now we had in, uh, processes that had 10 times faster MIPS ratings, but in real world applications, which we had, they would perform just the same. And the reason is that it wasn't clear what an instruction is. So a uh, CISC CPU does one instruction multiply and takes one clock cycle to execute. Uh, RISC CPU would take, would have much higher clock frequency, but it would take 16 instructions to do a multiply. And then of course you have fun things like the deck engineers, uh, the program that was used to evaluate the CPU performance was called Brystone. So the deck engineers actually looked at that particular program and then figured out that by changing their compiler, they could generate an executable that will run much, much faster on this dry stone benchmark. It would, that same optimization would be terrible for all other applications. It didn't make any sense, except for this one benchmark problem. So all of a sudden DEC had numbers that were much bigger than the competition because they added a special flag to their C compiler saying dash D dry stone, and then you would get a much higher rating. <laughs> So um, also uh, more recently, Eurobench is a, a large research in it initiative uh, run by the European Union about humanoid robot benchmarking. I think they are also misguided in a sense that they don't have a full application. They don't have a full sense perceived um, reason and action cycle. So they talk about uh, walking uneven terrain and they try to evaluate the performance of the robot, but 
as long as the robot doesn't fall over, you can walk as slowly as you want, right? So clearly, th this is <laughs> this is sort of important if, because if you if I tell people they're walking, the ro my robot is walking, they expect sort of a reasonable speed at least, right? They don't expect this boom, right? But uh, Eurobench, that will be a very stable robot, never fell over during our tests. Um, it must be complex enough so that you people cannot cheat, right? So it must be reasonably complex. And it has to lead to meaningful research outcomes. <coughs> I also believe that robustness is a key feature of intelligence. Anything that uh, for a very special application, I can develop and implement a solution uh, that will outperform uh, others. But the idea is really that we have one system, one algorithm that can deal with all the complexity that it faces in the world. Um, I also believe that humans are very bad at solving problems optimally. Um, for example, at NTNU, and I'm surely here, if uh, class finishes and people, uh, students walk over to the cafeteria, they all have different paths in which they go, right? But there should really only be one shortest path or one optimal path, right? But a lot of the reasoning that humans do is actually not optimally, but it's sort of satisfying. It's not the best, but it's good enough. It gets me to my coffee fast enough. So I, I don't spend the extra 30 minutes trying to figure out what really is the shortest path from here to uh, the cafeteria. Um, for specific tasks now, we have machine vision systems that can outperform humans, right? They can look at the uh, parts of the uh, Boeing airplane and it has a huge part of the fuselage, and it'll say, boom, that ribbon hole is off by a millimeter. No human could possibly do this. Right? But if you can control the lighting, you can control the sensor, you can do amazing things. But it wouldn't be a uh, general vision system or an AI system or pick and place robot. If you see the ABD there, <laughs> um, uh, the Delta robot can move very, very fast. So what do our robots do, however? Um, they get up, they play soccer, they walk into the wall, fall over, get up again, walk into the same wall, fall over, and the same wall again. Right? So my view is that for AI, uh, AI is not really ever about doing the optimal thing. Um, I saw it initially, the, the quote that uh, became known for was that AI is all about never doing the really stupid thing, like walking into the wall uh, continuously. And now I sort of refined that idea and uh, I call it the don't mess up period, the, the minimum don't mess up period. So if you want to achieve some task, your robot needs to 10 minutes to score a goal or it needs five minutes to uh, build a particular widget for your uh, company then that's, it has to run and perform every step correctly for five minutes. And that's a lot uh, easier than having to do that for 10 minutes without ever doing the really silly thing. <coughs> so um, I do believe that, and I, I'm heavily invested in robot competitions because I believe that they provide us with crucial ben benchmarks for guiding research at the moment. Um, I like sports. I've done a lot of sports when I was younger. And so uh, FIRA Competition, Federation of International Robot Athletes, uh, is a large international event, about 1,200 participants at the last one before COVID. And since then, we've been running uh, virtual events. Uh, 2022, we have, uh, again, a uh, sort of hybrid event where several hubs worldwide uh, in Taiwan and uh, Korea and um, uh, Brazil and Malaysia are running the localized competitions. And then at the same time, they all run the, the different events. So here are some pictures from the competition. I'll show 
some more about the humanoid robot competition in particular. Um, I'm, I, I already said I care very much about robustness and flexibility of the systems. So for uh, the uh, Euro Cup competition, you need to build a single robot that can compete in, men, in 10 different events. And um, that is sort of because if I if I talk about delivering mail in an office, for example, then you would never come up with the humanoid robot design. Right? You build something with wheels and a little column that drives around uh, with a little tray on top. It'll be much cheaper, much more efficient uh, than a humanoid robot would be. Uh, so we want a single robot that can do archery and sprint and marathon and obstacle run, United uh, play soccer, uh, triple jump. Spartan race, which is sort of an extreme mobility challenge, uh, weightlifting, basketball, and the mini DRC version. And I think the for humans, it's actually the same. If you look at the animal kingdom, then humans aren't the best at anything, right? A cheetah can run 80 kilometers per hour, and you won't even hear it, right? A uh, dolphin can easily outswim the uh, Mike Phelps, who are the best swimmers in the world. And um, monkeys can outclimb us easily. But what makes the human shape unique is that we're not the best, but we're in the top five in everything. So we're, we're not the best climbers, but we sure climb better than um, dolphins do. <laughs> and uh, so we, we're looking at uh, future applications uh, for rescue robots uh, for these kind of uh, devices. So here, let me just show you a couple of videos from the FIRA competition. One of the events is weightlifting. Now, we didn't just want to check what the maximum torque in your shoulder joint is, but this is really a balancing problem. Okay. So the robot has to has to walk towards the bar, has to recognize the bar, has to pick up the bar. So this is my team from 2019. How heavy is this? The robot is 7.5 kg. Uh, we are not very good in the um, weightlifting. Uh, I think this is about 30 discs. The world record is actually 90 discs, which is pretty impressive. That's uh, they are CDs, mm -hmm. and so. The robot has to walk exactly 50 centimeters with at least one foot touching that line. He has to lift the weight above its head. And now the center of mass is totally different. The dynamics change uh, dramatically. So now the robot has to adjust for this change in the center of mass. What's, and the, what's the weight of the weight compared to the weight of the robot? Um, I think it's... Uh, a hundred discs, I think, is about five, six kg. It's pretty heavy if you have to carry. Yeah. No, 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 click. I think no click. Yeah. And then I should be. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that's sort of fun is uh, the sprint. That's always a very exciting uh, event. And it also shows <laughs> uh, how simple, simple changes can have dramatic impact. So here, the challenge is to sprint, right? One advantage of you in sports is 
even if I don't tell you anything else, you know what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out how fast is this robot at short distances. Uh, we have a false start, so the robot <laughs> has to go back. Um, so here they have to walk forward three meters and then walk backward three meters. And when you think about it, the kinematics of the robot doesn't matter. The robot doesn't really care if it's walking forward or backwards. It can do both at the same speed. But all the robots are slower walking backwards than walking forwards. So um, the reason for that is that when you walk forward towards a target, then you only need a point reference. If I'm here and I walk towards the bucket, then the, the basket, then I just need to turn. I keep walking. I will stay within the line. Right? If you touch the lines, then it's uh, illegal. You have to get pulled back. You have to start the whole thing from scratch. If you walk backwards and there's some noise, and now I'm off the center line. If I now turn and it align with the basket and I keep walking backwards, now I will walk out of bounds. So for the backward step, uh, for the backward stage, you really need to have a line reference, which is why the markers that they have, a lot of them are three dimensional or have a right side and a left side. So you can figure out the relative orientation. Not something that we had thought of before when we set this up. Uh, the other nice thing about the uh, using sports, and in particular for the sprint, is that we we can actually show how our systems improve. The world record 2015 was a minute and 12 seconds. World record 2019, 23 seconds. So you can see every year how the, the performance of the system improves. Oh, let me... Yeah. <laughs> we have a Spartan race where we have uneven terrain with coins thrown on top of it. Uh, there's a ladder that the robot has to climb. The ladder is spacing. The rungs are spaced uh, non-uniformly. And this one I'm particularly proud of. This is my robot, the first humanoid robot that actually climbed the rope. So it had to go there and then find the rope and then start climbing the rope. Now, if you tell people I'm an AI researcher, my robot climbs the rope, then they think, oh, that should be pretty easy. But uh, I, re I would argue strongly that this requires a lot of intelligence. Um, one other thing that we've been working on, which I like, is the climbing wall. So the robot starts out behind, uh, far back from the wall, then takes a picture, figures out where the feet, foot and the handholds are, and then plants a path to climb to the top. And this I like particularly because this requires online motion planning. There's no way that you can pre-program all the possible ways in which the configuration for hand and foot hold. Now there we were still using hooks and the new version that we're working on this year has uh, more like sliding, the kind of, uh, if you do rock climbing, it would be like jug holes. Uh, so it, it's much harder to, you need to have, you have <coughs> more dynamic constraints. Yeah. Okay, so does anyone know where the holes are? Yes, uh, it takes a picture two meters away and then it walks up and then it starts climbing. So, um, because one of the problems with climbing is once you're in the wall, it's yeah, very I, difficult to see where the other holes are. Yeah, they would be the, impossible. The yes. So uh, it, it's a global planning problem, uh, global planner that we apply there. What happens if it falls? Like a human miscalculates and then they'll sort of jump back off the wall. What does it do? Well, luckily, they didn't fall <laughs> <laughs> so far. Um, yes, uh, I mean, they should be roped in, right? This is not, <laughs> yeah. everybody in health and safety would say this is no go. Right. <laughs> uh, here we have uh, obstacle run, which is uh, a slam problem. There is uh, obstacles in the way and you need to go from the start to the end zone without touching any of them. You need to figure out where the gates are that you can uh, walk through. 
uh, marathon outdoors, 421, uh, 425 meters, uh, one thousandth of the human marathon distance. Uh, as you can see in some of the pictures here, this makes the vision problem a lot more interesting, right? Because now you need to deal with shadows and uh, different surfaces that the robot go over. It's much more uneven than uh, in, an, in a building. So this is also a, a lot of fun. And now for the latest version, we don't actually have the track anymore. You just have markers like forward, turn right, turn left. <laughs> Um, which makes the vision problem more crucial, uh, more difficult. Uh, triple jump, so doing three long jumps in a row so that we can uh, measure it. That one is mainly a synchronization problem. We know what motion to execute, but you need to generate the, the timing between the different servo motors and the controller has to be very precise to be able to generate maximum uh, lift off force. Basketball, nobody can really dribble a ball at the moment. Uh, there, there are some other videos online uh, that you can watch. Uh, I'll just uh, skip them uh, here. Archery, um, there we're trying to beat the archery team at the National Taiwan Normal University, which is also the bronze medal winner of the Olympics. So they're a very strong team. Um, you can see a Thormang robot. This is about 15 meters. We can hit the bullseye. You can move the target around. You can move the robot. It can adjust. We do, uh, but uh, we implemented high performance, uh, highly accurate inverse kinematics. That was the, the main research challenge uh, for that point. Uh, if you want to go up against the Olympic team, you need to shoot 75 meters. Uh, our robots aren't strong enough to pull the, the bow that much. Uh, so we're still redesigning the upper body a little bit. Where's my mouse? Oh. Here? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <coughs> now, apart from robot athletes, I also have been working on uh, magic shows. Now, Magic, I think, is I'm particularly interested in it because if you look at the way that a, a lot of AI with deep learning convolutional networks work at the moment is that uh, we show a picture to the system and the system is supposed to interpret that picture in one go through it. So uh, there hasn't been much emphasis in AI research on the notion of attention. But I think attention is crucially important to human intelligence. So for example, if you look at this particular image, if you can interpret it in two ways, right? There's like, if this is a mouse, then this is an old grandma looking to the left. If this is a necklace and this is a neck, then it's a young lady looking away from you. So, um, for humans, this happens a lot. We pay attention, we see part of the information in the world out there, and we use that to constrain and interpret the remaining information that is uh, that we're looking at. So in a sense, humans actually are much more often than not, see what they expect to see rather than what they actually see, which is why uh, eyewitness accounts are very bad. Any kind of crime, right? What was the guy wearing? Oh. Uh, red shirt, blue shirt, it goes all over the place. Um, so attention is fundamental to magic, right? Because attention, magic is all about the misdirection of attention. I want you to look here, and this is where the trick happens. <coughs> so we've been running the uh, magic show for uh seven years now uh various tricks i will skip this one this one is also fun to watch um but uh, i'm gonna do this one here first and uh in fact i want you to play along with me so take out a coin and find a partner coin What's the coin, coin. <laughs> when was this oh, <laughs> You can use it as the chocolate too. Yes. Good. Anything small. 
<laughs> I, I, every two people just need one, need one um, Namung point. So everybody have a partner? You're not supposed to eat the props. <laughs> the prop, not eating the prop. Okay. So everybody have a partner? Then the trick, the trick is very simple. Uh, you put the coin, one of you put the coin behind your back. Okay, and then you're trying to determine which hand is the coin in. Right? So don't say anything yet. Don't don't say anything yet. So now I'll play it with Rob then, since you don't have a partner. So you take the coin <laughs> behind the back. <laughs> okay, good. Now cross your arms. Okay. Everybody cross their arms. Okay, then I would go with this one. I was wrong. Okay. <laughs> most people, most people actually will have the coin in the hand below. Rob is kind of unique. We knew that. <laughs> but psychologically, it's an interesting effect. Most people, when you ask them and uh, they don't think about it. You bring up the hands, the coin is in the in the bottom hand more often than not. So how many people did the work did uh, find it? How many? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, yeah, good. So um this is the magic trick that we were implementing with our robot. So you can follow along. Um, we won the competition, luckily, because we could do it three times in a row, and the robot found the coin correctly before we told people what how it actually works. Um, it also is an interesting thing because it took us about three months to figure out how to get which hand is on top. We have post net, body net. We have very good uh, skeletal. Uh, recognition for people, you can run that easily, right? But they sort of just tell you that the arms are crossed, but they don't tell you which arm is on top, and which one arm is on the bottom. So we tried vision, different uh, networking architectures, getting enough training data was a problem. So in the end, we, the competition was coming up. So we're like, okay, we just use the laser scanner. <laughs> so we use the laser scanner to figure out uh, where the arms are. Um, sometimes we have problems because one person would cross her arms like that and we didn't expect this. And uh, the one time it didn't work, it was because the kit was only like this tall. So our laser scanner didn't, didn't see any arms there at all. Again, and and then for the competition, you need to run the trick. And then afterwards, you need to explain the, the how the trick works and the technology behind the trick. So this is how it actually works. Uh, one fun thing that happened too during the competition is uh, this particular guy, uh, he, would, he would say, oh, no, it's not fair. The robot told me to put this arm underneath, <laughs> right, with the coin. And that's why, otherwise I would have done it the other way. But the robot showed like this. And I'm, then I said, but think about it. If the robot knows it's in this hand so that he tells you to move this one underneath, he wouldn't even need to ask you to cross anything. He'll just tell you this is where the hand is with the coin, right? And then, oh, okay, okay. But, but he was adamant that he was uh, mind controlled by the robot. <laughs> And here's a fun uh, magic trick. I'll play that one and I'll talk along. This is uh, spikes. So students enjoy. Oh, actually, we have no sound. We could do, well, we could do sound. Actually, never mind. I'll, <laughs> I'll just talk about what happens. Um, so it's uh, the nail, right? The professor can have his, have his hand. Uh, seriously wounded, that's always a, 
uh, attraction for the students. They like to run this particular trick. <coughs> and it works particularly well in uh, Taiwan. So we, we get ready right now. And we say we're doing research, uh, deep learning, manipulation of soft objects because we need to pick up the paperbacks, but the paperbacks are not solid. Right. So to make the weight, so you cannot just tell by the robot lifting it, we add the wooden base to all three bags. Is that the same? There's some jokes that we tell, which <laughs> I forgot now exactly what we were saying. But anyway, now people check. There's a real spike there. So now the robot gives instructions saying we will put the uh, spike into the bag. Then the student is going to shuffle them around randomly. And uh, the person then can call out right, middle, left. And if it's safe, the robot will push my hand down. And if it's not safe, the robot will say not safe. Right? That's the idea. So then what the student says in Chinese now, Right. So I explain all of this in English, so not in Chinese. The uh, my my student Green says, "Oh, listen, guys, the professor wants us to do this, and we've tried everything. It just doesn't work. So we always put the spike in the middle slot. So don't use the middle slot because if we injure the professor, we definitely cannot graduate. So please, whatever you do, not the middle slot. And then they they look." how they move the thing around and they make sure it's in the middle slot, right? And then of course, everybody's laughing because the professor doesn't speak Chinese, right? Like me, I don't speak Chinese. So uh, this goes, uh, is some cheating happening right in front of me. And you can tell the body language is quite good. She's a good actress. <laughs> Whatever you do, not the middle one. <laughs> and then, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so then, uh, maybe I can. Without the sound, it's you can you can watch it on YouTube too. Okay. Oh, because we needed some paper bags and we got uh, donations from McDonald's. We should, uh, yeah, yeah. We should have asked them for sponsorship. And it says, okay, put your hand there. <laughs> oh, no, there's some. Right. Left. Okay, left. So now the volunteer called left. Okay. <laughs> and most people are nice. Nobody has actually deliberately tried to hurt me yet. No, 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 no. Nobody has tried to hurt me yet. <laughs> deliberately. Extension? Yeah, I think so. Okay, right. So now they call right. And now our robot crashes, but it's it's fake, like the robot because if we just go down right, then they think it's correct, right? Because the middle one is where the spike is. They know the middle one is the spike. 
So now it says, oh, I don't think this one is saved. We move to the other one. Mm -hmm. no. So now somebody should say something, right? Say, hey, professor, this is not working correctly. Why? Dramatic music. <laughs> so now the spike magically moved from the middle to the right side. And now it picks up the back, and in the back is the actual spike. Yeah. So it's a sleight of hand, but the, the sleight of hand is uh, uh, done by the, not really done by the robot yet, the uh, human helps him. So I'm not quite happy, 100% happy with the trick yet, but it's a, it's a pretty good show on him. So I can pull it out and then let her Um, this one I will show as well. This was an entry from last year. I'm smarter than you. <laughs> So definitely terminative wipes going out there. So for computer, this is not really that impressive, right? <laughs> to be able to change the text to speech uh, <laughs> sounds. That's right. Mind reading. People think that it's a superpower, but in reality, it's pretty simple. Timer, facial expression, body language. Even your blood pressure. There are too many clues to evaluate what you are thinking. I know you don't believe me. You just need to see the evidence. You. But then in Taiwan, they always think about the food. So this is a lucky guess. <laughs> Pretty safe guess. <laughs> of course, very good choice. Um, forget it. I can prove it another way. Give me my cards. So now we have a stack of cards. Can't really be a magician if you can't manipulate cards. You can see 10 cards inside. Trick them out and put them onto the desk. Okay. 
<laughs> Please take all of your cards from the desk. Let's shuffle the cards. And I wish my robot could shuffle the cards yet, but no, it's a very difficult problem. Put the cards back. Even picking them up off the table would be difficult. Yeah, yeah. Every step is important. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like a traditional ripple shuffle or hand shuffle in the shard. Oh. Yeah, soft grippers will be something that we really need. Yes, yeah. but also tactile feedback is really important. Yeah. So now, what's the car? Eight, no, seven. Now put the car back with the right hand. But all the perception is done automatically. Correct. Sure. Yeah, see when you just put the cards back. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, please make the cards based on the pudding in front of you. He raises the separate camera and he tries to write the argument. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, this, this, one, this one actually has no, this wouldn't be allowed because yeah, sure. it's. Uh, <laughs> No, no, it's supposed to be a self-contained system, so it's just supposed to be the robot. That was my hand. This time, please don't think about your dinner. <laughs> so now I was trying to figure out what the card was. Watch my eyes. Keep your hands on me. Don't be nervous. Take it easy. I'm not going to hurt you. Is the person being briefed in any way? But it's not putting these off the, the cards on the, the dots? Or something? No, no. Uh, that's just as a uh, salient cue. So mo most people will put it on the dots. If they put it. Mm -hmm. Very much away from the dots, it wouldn't work. But as long as they're like in yeah. a reasonable area, yeah. 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 and the robot detects where the parts are. Um, one advantage for doing vision in magic is that it's usually by tradition, a black tablecloth. So that makes things a little bit easier. And this enormous sight on with your hand is about the card. But you are not a robot. At some point just now, your pupils were dilated and you were sweating. <laughs> Let me think. I think your card is up. Your card is in the part. Am I right? So it was the eight of hearts. Then where's my applause? <laughs> yes. So the way that trick works, um, if you look at the cards that we have, uh, the eight of hearts is actually not symmetric. Uh, there's an extra heart in one side. So if you rotate it by 180 degrees, you can tell. All the cards that we have are the non-symmetric cards. Uh, I forgot what they are, but there's like 20 of them that you can use. And uh, the instructions were to shuffle the cards, right? Which means they don't rotate by 180 degrees because the robot shows it like that. And then uh, the volunteer picks up the card, puts it in front of the head, and moves with the left hand, which rotates the card by 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. So now we have to detect the cards. We have to detect the position of the cards and the orientation of the cards, which is not that easy. Like some of them, it's it's just the, 
the flip of a single heart or a single uh, spade that tells us which direction is off. But we got that accurate enough to be able to do this, this magic trick. <laughs> Um, there's no, uh, it doesn't measure heart rate or anything like that if you're, if you're worried about this. <laughs> um, we are just like the true magicians. Um, they always say that magicians are the most honest people in the world because they uh, lie to you, but at least they tell you that they lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll skip some of these other ones. Uh, this one is one that we're working on right now, which I think is kind of fun. Uh, you have the different parts with the magic symbols, uh, square, star, plus, waves, and a circle. And we just calculate, we ask you to draw it, and we calculate the optical flow. So we can actually see what you're drawing on the path. And then we just need to classify it, and then we can tell you what you drew. Mm -hmm. um, this works uh, surprisingly reliable. When I came up with the idea, I wasn't sure if it was actually going to work, but even different people drawing it, it's quite good. Um, I want to make this into a internet magic trick, but it will be a little bit uh, too obvious if you ask people to hold up the pad and draw them. So. Right now we're generating some training data, just looking at the upper body of your shoulders and see if we can detect what you're actually drawing by looking at just how your shoulders move. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I'll skip this. Um, I just wanted to show you our latest project. Uh, which is driving a scooter with our humanoid robot. So here we're doing some balancing tests. We can actually push the scooter and the robot sits on top of the electric scooter and actually uh, steer it. This is our emergency brake. We have a student running beside it with the robot. <laughs> pull so that we have a brake. Um, and one time when we were running tests with the actual driving, uh, here I have an app that I wrote uh, in Android on the mobile phone. It can actually talk to the robot. And now I can use the uh, $300,000 remote control toy car because I can say go forward, balance, steer left, steer right. Um, that, uh, we're getting better and better. Uh, this is one of our very earliest attempts. <laughs> So it took off and ran into the, the thing. We weren't quite fast enough. And my biggest problem is that the president of NTNU parks his Tesla in that lot always. And so I told students, if if you guys crash that scooter into that Tesla, then I'll definitely be out of a job. <laughs> so, so try not to do that, please. Um, for because of the the presentation that I heard about the uh, in the other lab about Dexter and the um, teleoperation and sort of the problems with inverse kinematics, actually driving the scooter turned out to be one of the toughest challenges that we had at the beginning. Was not the balancing. We actually came up with a balancing controller that we trained in reinforcement learning that works very well. And we also implemented a traditional control algorithm that can balance the scooter well. Uh, it was the inverse kinematics problem because for inverse kinematics, the problem is that uh, A, we have a closed loop kinematics and that's the same problem that you had with your Dexter robot. You have the, the whole thing is linked as a loop. If you need to steer, the both hands need to move uh, so that the steering angle is correct. But the uh, problem was that most of the inverse kinematics algorithms are only concerned with uh, error as in position error, the distance to the target location, right? And uh, all of the error then is sort of the same. So it doesn't matter if you're up a little bit or down a little bit, it would be counted as the same error. And the uh, uh, Jacobian inverse methods or Jacobian transpose methods or whatever you want to use um, 
will solve that. For the scooter, the interesting thing is that actually our steering angle, if we have some air in the steering angle, it's not, it's a problem, but it's not such a big problem. The biggest problem is the throttle because the throttle on these Gogoro scooters are extremely sensitive. So if we're like this, we're going at one kilometer per hour. If we're like this, we're going at 27 kilometers per hour, which uh, makes it very, very difficult to balance the scooter. So we actually completely reformulated our IK uh, system to be a multi-valued optimization problem with uh, different weights. And um, we use uh, particle swarm optimization in order to be able to make sure that we have very fine, very good control over the angle of the end effector, which is what our throttle setting is. And we tolerate uh, errors in the position, in the steering angle. And you want to, you can play our game uh, that we implemented. The goal of this research Picture. Picture. Sorry, press the guitar. No, only tablet is my rubbish. Seven. <laughs> so the goal is to pass the Taiwanese uh, driving test for scooters, which is done on a on a closed circuit, so we can actually do it. I think, yeah, it wasn't. And uh, then you can do like WASD. Uh, this is a Taiwan, Taiwan Black Bear. I actually made this in Blender. And then to make the game a little bit more interesting, it'll run up to the player and knock him off the scooter if you're too slow. And uh, you can play that yourself. Uh, if we have the server running, then we actually be recording the control commands that people send. Uh, the falling over is turned off, so you can you won't actually fall off the scooter, right? So we simplified it. Otherwise, it's very difficult to control a scooter with the keyboard. We made it uh, simple enough. And then uh, for the driving test, yeah, you can try. The first challenge is <laughs> yeah, just a pass too fast. The first challenge is you need to drive 15 meters in a straight line with a maximum uh, width of uh, 30 centimeters, and it must be slower than seven seconds. So you have to drive very slow, and that's the first uh, test that you need to pass. It's super easy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, now the bear caught you again. Uh, the second thing is uh, uh, railway crossing, simulated railway crossing. Then there's this hook turn. I don't think they probably don't have it anywhere except in Taiwan and uh, Japan. Um, you let me go. So here is the railway crossing. <laughs> And now the, the train is gone, so I can drive. How do you do this? <laughs> this is, and then here you need to stop because there's a traffic light on the top. And now we have a green light. And then this is this hook turn. So in Taiwan, you don't actually turn left. Uh, if you want to turn left, you go across the intersection. And there's a little box there. They need to drive into the box. And then you need to wait there for the next green line. So instead of, so that the scooters, because there's like millions of scooters in Taiwan, so that they're not stuck in the middle of the road. And of course, for you guys, of course, we're on the correct side of the road. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's that, right? But um Yes, uh, so for you, it will be a right-hand turn so that the scooters are not stuck in traffic in the middle of the road, waiting to clear through the intersection. You go straight and then you turn right and then you go straight again. Uh, so the idea is to use this to, in order to get some training data for the path planner, which would be the higher level system, not, not actually, but, 
the algorithm that runs here for kinematics, inverse kinematics, all of this is exactly the same code that we run on the real robot. So, so that's pretty cool. The whole thing is implemented uh, on web technologies using 3JS and everything. So um, I, I know you guys use a lot of ROS and lots of other people use a lot of ROS, but it's a real nightmare to install uh, for lots of systems. Uh, ROS2 even worse. So we're moving, I, I'm, I'm thinking it's uh, smarter to move with the web technology because Google and Microsoft has millions of dollars, thousands of people working on optimizing that particular technology stack. But uh, yes, that brings me to the end of my presentation. I think I ran a little bit over time, so sorry. So we can take some time for questions, and um, Robert, you can monitor the questions from the home audience. Take any questions from people here. So I, I, I will start. Yes. You have stated already. Let's say one impression. Um, all these humanoid robots. First of all, thank you very much for the presentation. Really fantastic. I enjoyed the, the idea of the benchmarking. Uh, all, all the elements are brilliant. Um, one thing that I'm always thinking is that all those robots are pretty much the same. They still use similar kinematics, similar kinematic, kinematic chains. Um, so the question is, how much is important the body of the robot to solve the specific task in case of uh, locomotion? So how much is demanded to the hardware, the mechanical side, to do a kind of uh, mechanical computation? And leave other mechanic or other analysis to the higher level uh, layers. I think uh, it goes in spurts. So uh, probably until about three years ago, most of the kinematics and the robot systems were very similar. There wasn't much difference. Uh, the main difference was for a robot that you want to where you wanted to walk very quickly. Uh, a lot of people were using parallel kinematics in the legs, or for very tall adult-sized humanoid robots, you would use parallel kinematics because then you get more power into your knee joint, which was crucial. You could double up the knees. But uh, the upper body torso were very similar. Um, but now with the uh, better reductions and uh, the harmonic drives, uh, we now have a new generation of humanoid robots coming online that are using the harmonic drives uh, like uh, Kathy and um, the new robot from Romella, which actually can balance on just tiny feet, like only this big, the feet are just that big. And it cannot do things like uh, playing soccer, but it can, uh, it can walk very well. So I think there's sort of now... Uh, it, it always goes in waves. So for a while now, we worked out the control of uh, parallel kinematic humanoid robots and how to get them to be able to do things like kicks. And, and now we're moving into new hardware design. So I think in the next five years, I would expect uh, quite a big variation of new humanoid robot designs. Also, as far as actuators are concerned, uh, basically our power to weight ratio with servo motors is very weak compared to humans. It's like having a 200 year old person do weightlifting or something like that. So um, we we're getting better better batteries, hopefully in the near future. And, and certainly there will be changes in the mechanical design and the uh, uh, actuators that we'll use. Not, not all the way up to Atlas, which uses uh, hydraulics. So, because that's uh, extremely expensive. But even in the space that sort of research labs, university, I think our balancing algorithms have now improved so that we can greatly reduce the size and the weight of the feet, which will allow our robots to walk much more quickly. Another question after the question about whether you can have a question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a two more questions. Yeah. Um, 
in the double jump, you have strings in it, right? That that was actually just a, that wouldn't be allowed according to the competition. Mm -hmm. That was just a, sort of a test robot that we built mm -hmm. because I think if you can figure out the the right frequency, the resonance frequency of your sprints, and use the dynamics so you can store energy for a short amount of time, then that's actually what humans do in your in your legs in your tendons. So why don't you use the sprints normally even when you work? We would, but um, at this this picture was just because uh, it's hard to get the robot to walk with the sprints. Exactly. So we thought it's easier to just do the triple jump first. And so this robot was out of competition for, for this particular event. But um, we also had trouble controlling it. So it wasn't really a very successful design. I think we didn't model the springs well enough. I think it could be an advantage if we if we did more work on it, but the student then uh, graduated and mm -hmm. so we're sort of stuck, but I want to continue this. I think uh, one way of making the humanoid robots walk better and also making the mechanical design more interesting is to introduce springs into the design. Also, I think these kind of compliant actuators are extremely important for cobots and things like that. If you want the robot to work in close proximity to humans, then uh, all the software that you implement uh, is, is all fine and good and modeling and, and simulating dynamics, but actually having springs in there so that your robot is compliant is, is I think, extremely important. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> this is not me trying to get attention. <laughs> um, uh, it's probably a, a bear on a field or an elephant in the room. The we all love competitions, and we've been starting Global Cup teams. Uh, been involved one it was all in the, at home league, etc. And they are really rewarding and they're engaging for students. The biggest challenge is always getting state of the art papers out of them. It was my experience. So I wonder what yes. your experience is from that and, and what we need to do to, well, maybe it works very well for you, but I find it always very difficult to then argue any funders or even the university to say like, well, let's put some money to this because it's, it's not the right kind of outputs necessarily that are being- Right, and I think the situation is probably worse in Taiwan, which is a bit more conservative, but, uh, I've been lucky. Um, the FIRA competition and RoboCup and the Magic Show are sort of reasonably well known now. Uh, two funding agencies and the the president of the university, uh, so that they value our participation in those events. Um, I sort of thought about the the problem with. Uh, papers and publications right now coming out of RoboCup and FIRA competitions. One of the issues is that you're supposed to, a lot of the papers sort of go and we present state-of-the-art performance with this tiny improvement, right? So you have these benchmark data sets and machine learning, you can run it, then you get SOTA and, and improve it a little bit. That's done. I think that is actually a very tough way to get papers out of the um, competitions. What we find is if you if you rephrase the problem slightly, then it's an easier path. So, for example, uh, with the inverse kinematics, we could we could say, okay, for this particular problem, these approaches do not work. And uh, the current state of the art, we're trying to evaluate what kind of applications they fail and what kind of applications they don't fail. So instead of sort of trying to come up with yet another algorithm that's 0.2% better on the standard benchmark problem. We're saying, okay, these are the algorithms that people are using. They say they work. Here's what they do on our robots. And uh, we're, we're investigating under what condition, they usually don't work nearly as well. Right? And we're trying to uh, classify and investigate under which conditions, what, what is the feature that makes them go from 99% performance on ImageNet to 
not being able to detect a panda from a gibbon in the real world. And I think these kind of papers uh, are also, uh, well, you can publish those. Yeah, yeah. They are. And I would argue that, yes, we need them and we need them more. I would right, yes, yes. Like that, yeah. that corner. But I think it's it's probably particularly a UK problem also that these are not necessarily seen as significant in terms of these excellence research excellence frameworks assessments that we do here. So what my experience tells me there that this sort of this is just an, a survey and evaluation paper. It's not a new contribution to the state of the art. While I would argue this is probably what gives us the biggest increase in knowledge and understanding, mm -hmm. but it's still probably part of the system that we live in, making yes. particular here that it is not necessarily getting the reward that it advances the academic careers in, in many mm -hmm. cases. That is a problem. Definitely uh, robot competitions. I would argue are extremely important for your students. Like I, mm -hmm. I, I have students. I'm very proud of the students that I have. Uh, Brian, for example, is one that came in. He he joined my lab. He had a B minus in everything and was really motivated. He's now one of the lead developers for Assassin's Creed. If you know the uh, Ubisoft game. I had other students that work for Avatar, Avatar 2, the motion capture, director of motion capture is one of my students. And I think they have very successful careers. They make a lot more money than me. Uh, uh, and I think part of it is the competition. So, but they are not on the shortest path for your academic career. That's absolutely true, I think. Um, IEEE now, they uh, they actually asked me to, to run the magic show. So at least IEEE, IROS, some of the conferences now recognize the value of competitions. And uh, I think that's, that's very good. But the political higher echelon of, of the academic senate or, or the royal society, I assume those guys, uh, they are a little bit behind the times, I think. Unfortunately, uh, I choose to still do the robot competitions. Uh, I think it's extremely beneficial even for my research in the other areas because it constantly gives me new ideas. It's, it's crucial for our students. Um, uh, but I wish funding agencies would rank them high, I guess. I'm conscious that we've run pretty much over time. So I think um, we're going to stop here. Um, let's thank Jackie. <laughs> oh, and uh, before I forget, uh, also um, NTNU, if you're interested in these kind of projects, uh, we have a scholarship program organized by the Taiwanese government. So if you would like to do an internship or six months uh, external semester, then uh, please contact me or Betsy, you know, will get me in contact. Um, just if, if that's something that would interest you. Great. Thank you, everybody. For Thanks for showing up. This, this is what the last seminar in the Ugly Forward Seminar Series organized by the University of Lincoln. And we will now uh, move on with the seminar series being organized by the University of East Anglia in the next academic year. Thank you, everybody, for participating.